I'd like to call to order the City of Lake Forest School District 67 Board of Education meeting for Tuesday, May 28, 2013. You may have a roll call vote, Madam. You may have a roll call, Madam Clerk. Mr. Anderson. Present. Mrs. Fisher. Present. Mr. Schuler. Here. Mrs. Clemenson. Present. Mr. Borkowski. Present. Mr. Lamke. Present. Mr. Folker. Present. We have a quorum. May I have a motion to remove the dismissal of a tenured teacher from the agenda? So, so moved. moved. Second. Uh, may I have a roll call vote, Madam Clerk? Mrs. Fisher. Aye. Mr. Folker. Aye. Mrs. Clemenson. Aye. Mr. Lemke. Aye. Mr. Schuler. Aye. Mr. Borkowski. Aye. Mr. Anderson. Aye. Motion carries. The first item on the agenda is the President's report. And uh, I'd like to start by expressing uh, profound appreciation and gratitude for the service of Julia Wald, Jeff Pendersky, Lori Rose, and John Julian for their work on the District 67 Board. During their tenure, the District made great strides on many fronts. We mentioned these in detail in the resolution to be adopted at our previous meeting. But I want to focus one more time on the incredible personal commitment in terms of time and effort that each of these citizens made. Everyone should be grateful um, for their service to the community. Second, I want to welcome back Leslie Fisher and Rick Schuler. Thanks for your continuing service to Lake Forest and for agreeing to serve as chairs of the Education and Finance Committee. Third, I'd like to welcome again our four new members, Beth, Rob, Jeff, and Mike, and to thank them for taking on this important job. Each of you brings great experience to your position and will make a big positive impact on the board. I know you and all our board members are committed to operating in a manner which is open, honest, and transparent. Since being sworn in two weeks ago, the new board members have been hard at work. They've attended a three-hour orientation with the ISBE. They have met with the superintendent and senior administrators of the district. Some attended a workshop with a law firm which specializes in educational law. In short, they've received a crash course on the role of a school board member in the operations of the district. To our new members, by your election, you've been selected as the representatives through whom the community's vision for the district will be developed, policies will be enacted, and oversight will be performed. As new board members, you've been entrusted with tremendous authority. With this authority, of course, comes lots of responsibility. Responsibility for a tradition of outstanding public education in Lake Forest, which dates back more than 150 years. Responsibility for stewardship over a budget of $35 million, almost all of which comes from Lake Forest citizens. Responsibility and appreciation for over 300 employees of our district who have made the education of its children their career. And most importantly, responsibility for the primary education of nearly 2,000 students who will spend their most formative years as students in our district. I encourage you to approach this job with dedication, open-mindedness, with humility, and with the respect for all stakeholders involved. Re resist the temptation to think that you, me, or any one person has all the answers. Learn from those with experience. Seek out board members from other districts. Read about education and become familiar with the important topics which we will discuss. Just as our students are better off when they go into a test well prepared, so you will be better board members if you are as well. This isn't to say that as new members, you're expected to be silent or sit on the sidelines. Ask tough, hard questions, hold others accountable, hold yourselves accountable. And as board members, always look for ways to empower our district and its educators to do a better job teaching our students. That concludes the President's report. The next item is the Superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. And I have the privilege of introducing some of our friends and family and staff and like to begin with um, Mrs. DeVore for her day out and the eighth grade community service project that uh, she and a number of students performed together. Good evening. It's nice to be here. So we had an opportunity this year. Uh, APT came to me um, September, October. They saw that I was the new kid on the block and came with a great idea. It was a big idea. Uh, but the idea was um, to do something different for our students with regards to their gift back to the community. In the past, they had fundraised for uh, a tangible gift, 
And um, this year, they came with the idea that they wanted to give back 2013 community service hours. And it's a, it was a huge project, and I can't even take credit for it because the APT really put this together, our eighth grade activities committee, um, Elizabeth Abatista, Robin Ford, and Jenny Zinzer um, did an amazing job of creating basically a day where all of our eighth graders went out to 16 different organizations within the community, anywhere from Bernie's Book Bank to North Chicago to Dickinson Hall, Westmoreland. Um, and I think it was a little bit of a scary process. The teachers didn't really know what to expect. I'm not sure what the kids knew what to expect. But when everybody came back, it was such a powerful experience to hear from both the teachers and the kids. Um, I am happy to say that we not only met our goal of 2013 hours, we exceeded it. Um, our students um, gave back 2,654 hours, and 95% of our eighth graders um, actually participated in, in giving service. So that's a pretty phenomenal number. I did bring a couple of students with me today to speak about their experiences. Um, Justin McMahon went to North Chicago, and then Gabrielle Prindle went to Dickinson Hall. So uh, without further ado, I would like to pass it on to Justin. Good evening. I'm, uh, my name is Justin McMahon. I'm an eighth grade student at Deer Path Middle School. And uh, on May 10th, as an eighth grade uh, student body, we traveled to many different locations to uh, participate in the community service project. This was, uh, as Mr. Vore said, a commitment to, uh, to complete the 2013 service hours this year. I went to an elementary school in North Chicago to uh, read and uh, paint pictures with the young kids. It was um, a really fun experience for me and the kids because they had a lot of fun. And uh, the students, unfortunately, don't have an art class, but um, we read like short stories to them and painted uh, the like these flowers that were in the short story. So that was a lot of fun to uh, work side by side with the kids. Uh, individually, I've done many service projects through my uh, church. So uh, <coughs> I've had the opportunity to work with others, like help others. Uh, however, some of my classmates um, that like don't get that opportunity had the opportunity on uh, May 10th to do that, and I uh, hope that encourages everyone, like my classmates and uh, other people, to keep on doing service hours for uh, this community. Uh, the service project made me look deeper into what I'm blessed with living here in Lake Forest. Um, my understanding of the importance of giving back to those less fortunate grew after my participation in the project. Uh, now I definitely value the things in my life that are really important to me and mean a lot, and I keep on planning to uh, uh, do service projects throughout uh, high school and beyond. Thank you for listening. Um, hello, I'm Gabrielle Prindle, and I'm here representing the Dickinson Hall Service Project Group. As you know, our class gift this year was community service. We were our challenge was to go along with the motto, look back, give back, celebrate, to finish our final year at Deer Path. About four weeks ago, we voted during homeroom on what project or charity we wanted to do service for. And as soon as my homeroom teacher described the service project at Dickinson Hall, I knew that I wanted to do it. I had done service before, and every time I'd had to do with music. Just this past Christmas, I played music for the residents of Westmoreland that couldn't come home for the holiday. I love any chance to use a gift that I have to bring joy to other people. So when my teacher said that the students going to Dickinson Hall would get a chance to perform a few songs for the people at the luncheon there, I immediately put it down for my first choice. On the days leading up to it, we had meetings to decide what we were playing and then to practice the songs. Our project was special. No other groups practiced like this. On May 10th, the day of the project, the other groups left at the beginning of the day. We stayed behind at school and rehearsed. When we finally got there, around lunchtime, we were instructed on how to serve, always from the right, and we set the tables and poured the water. When the people got there, we greeted them, took their coats, and made sure they were comfortable in their seats. We chatted with them about their grandchildren and served them when it was time. I learned that I was a pro at slicing sandwich loaf. Once they were finished eating, we got to perform. It went really well. On the first song, Will sang so beautifully that a few of the women cried. The other two songs left them clapping and tapping their feet. Afterwards, they were all asking us questions about our music. They had really enjoyed the performance. Even the ones that did not talk to us in the beginning were enthusiastic. I learned that music was a really good way to connect to people, even if, if it seems like you have nothing in common with them. The service project was a great experience that I will never forget. 
We all learned so much doing it, and I am so glad our class gave it as a gift. It was a gift not only to those who received it, but also to us. Thank you. Great job, you two. Okay. That's it. That's uh, all we have. Thank you very much, Mrs. DeVore. And uh, from uh, looking at the students and the proud parents in the audience, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing to sit up here and, and see the proud faces looking this way. And I know that there are really committed community members that they're out there that are raising their kids to do just what they've been doing. And uh, it's a real ethic in the community. And it's really nice to hear that the kids have learned some of the things that uh, they get from home. So thank you very much, kids, for coming. Uh, you're the best part of every board meeting. And uh, uh, also, uh, in, a, in a different experience that uh, took place in our schools recently, uh, Mrs. Leafman, Leafman would like to tell us about uh, some diversity training that occurred. Good evening, thank you for having us. Um, we're always looking for ways to bring our character traits that we celebrate in our district to life. And we had an opportunity to partner with the NAACP earlier this month and to bring sensitivity training to our seventh graders. And as our future leaders of the building, we felt that um, having this opportunity to, um, and, uh, to dive into sensitivity and, and all the layers of it um, was, um, a great opportunity for our seventh graders. So I have three students, um, Jed Thomas, Parker Mesner, and Hannah Scholey, who will talk about the experience. Hello, I'm Jed Thomas, and I'm in seventh grade. At the start of the month in May, members from the NAACP came in to talk about sensitiv sen a sensitivity lesson. Um, he, our leader first talked about a little bit about American history. We all shared where our ancestors came from and our families. He talked about different religions and cultures and how we, we should respect them. He gave us he gave some students slips of paper with one he gave some students slips of paper with one of these religions or cultures and put try to put us in into their shoes. Some of the religions were Muslim, Christian, or Jewish. The class talked about what they thought about the, the, these religions or cultures. Then we regrouped, then we regrouped and talked about how, how we felt about this. Then he engaged us in conversation. For example, some of the students thought that if you were homeless, you were not educated or dumb, which is a stereotype because most homeless people are just wounded veterans or have a di mental disability. Another stereotype was that if you're African American, the first thing that a student said was African Americans play basketball. This is a stereotype, obviously. He, he then explained that some African Americans might, might take offense to this even if they play basketball. This exercise was meant to not only help kids speak, uh, think before they speak, but also to be sensitive towards other people's feelings and, and actions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Parker Messner. I'm in seventh grade, and a couple weeks ago, uh, the seventh grade participated in sensitivity training session, and so these are some of the things that we discussed. The main point was that you should think before you speak, and you need to consider whether or not what you're gonna say could be potentially hurtful to someone, and you also need to think that is what you're gonna say necessary, and if not, then you just shouldn't say it at all. And this kind of reconfirmed what I've been taught at home and at school, and I think that a lot of people also kind of knew this, but I think it was also a good learning experience. And I'm confident that the students at Deer Path will be continue to be thoughtful of their actions and words. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hannah Shally, and I'm on the seventh grade gold team. Our activity was a little different than theirs. In our group, some people got labels and some people didn't though they didn't know what their label was. The others would walk around and interact with the people with the labels in a stereotypical way. They had to guess based on what people said. After a few minutes, she called up both someone with and without a label, and we reflected. She asked how we both, they both felt. People with the label said they felt insecure and that they weren't good enough. 
She explained that you don't know people's background stories and you shouldn't, and they don't know what they've get been through. This was a great activity because it reminded you not to judge or give people labels because things like this happen in places all around and even in school. She also talked to us about how if we may look different, we all have things in common, which all brings us together. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Leafman. Any other comments? Now, this is something that you put together for, uh, for the students. How many students were involved total? Um, every seventh grader, so 260. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much yeah. for your ongoing work with emotional wellness, and this is part of that, yep. correct? Definitely. All right, thank, thank you very you. much. Students, thank Thanks. you very much for coming. And that concludes the superintendent's report. The next item on the agenda is uh, public participation. Are there any members of the audience who would like to address the board on any uh, issue of their choosing? Seeing none, we will move to the next item on the agenda, reports and discussions. Uh, and I ask the superintendent to uh, introduce the first report. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I'd like to invite uh, Mrs. Epke uh, to the microphone. Maybe you'd like to present a uh, number of different projects that are occurring within uh, social studies. And it's nice to see the, the number of students here as, a, as the supporting cast for what was really really My part's cool really work. short. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. We'll get right to the we'll Thank get right you. to the main event here. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, earlier this year, um, as you may know, I'm the director of instructional technology, but I also have the honor of being the director of social studies as well. And uh, uh, early last summer, Andy kind of tasked us with um, creating some integrated units. And besides being tasked by the assistant superintendent, we also found that it was really kind of na uh, quite a natural thing for the social studies um, teachers in the district to begin doing. Also, educational research suggests that the integration of subject matter strengthens students' skills and helps students learn material at a deeper level. Further, the integrated units provide a more authentic and interactive learning environment that mimics the real world. As I said, because of these benefits, some of our district social studies teachers have spent this year working on the creation of integrated units most frequently integrating social studies and language arts with a particular focus on integrating the English language arts common core standards. As we plan for the next school year, we'll be continuing our work in identifying curricular connections and revise our curriculum to create even more integrated units. One unit from this school year we would like to highlight involves our fourth grade. Last summer, a committee of fourth grade teachers representing each of the elementary schools met to redesign their third trimester social studies unit on the study of countries and cultures around the world. The curriculum redesign integrated the fourth grade being a writer curriculum with social studies objectives and included more 21st century skills like self-directed learning, collaboration, cultural understanding, global awareness, and research and information literacies. What resulted is a unit called Caravans 2.0 where the activities and projects center on the big idea where people live has an effect on who they are. With us tonight are fourth graders from Mrs. Lisa Gross's class to tell you more about this exciting unit. Here are Caroline Walsh, Sophie Gambit, Gavin Maxwell, Alex Passanotto, Susa Carlson, and Kenny Peterson Ross. This spring, all fourth graders in District 67 had the opportunity to participate in an interdisciplinary unit called Caravans. This unit incorporated reading, writing, math, geography, oral language, and 21st century learning skills that were all incorporated into one exciting game. We were grouped into caravans that traveled around the world in search of artifacts. In order to travel, we had to earn travel dots by completing Web 2.0 projects in writing nonfiction books. At the end of the unit, the caravan that collects the most gold will be the winner. 
We would like to share an animal with you that shows fourth graders from all three elementary schools working on this unit. During this unit, we have been writing our own nonfiction book about a country of our choice. We are writing this book collaboratively with our writing partner. In order to publish our books, we are using Neos, Netbooks, and Dells. Our class had a special opportunity to use iPads to publish our books. We are using an app called Creative Book Builder. This app creates an EPUB that can be open and read in iBooks. We are able to share our ebooks beyond our classroom walls with an even wider audience through the use of iPads and uh, apps and the iPad. Due to the limited number of iPads available to, to fourth grade students, we were the only class that got to use this great tool. We hope more fourth graders will get to use it next year. We would like to share with you some samples of our books. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our learning with you this evening. Caravans have taught us so much about ourselves and what we are capable of learning with the right tools and opportunities. And thanks to 
each of you for giving us the opportunity to hear all about this. We don't get to be in school every day, so it's wonderful to see. The next report. Mrs. Gross, do you mind if I ask you a question as well? <laughs> All right. Yeah, they can't go yet. Don't let them go yet. All right. All right. Sure. So this is a big a project, question. and kids, you know you have a really good teacher, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She teaches all of us all kinds of stuff. We learn all sorts of things. So in the course of this project, which you guys worked really long and really hard on this as teachers, and part of that was to try to get the teachers out of the spotlight and put the students into the spotlight. So what, Mrs. Gross, did you learn about your students and about yourself in the course of this project? Um, I would say that I learned about my students that they are always capable of much more than I can anticipate. And it's always such a pleasant surprise to see what they're able to create. Even tonight, Gavin was saying, now, Mrs. Gross, I don't think you need to load the Animoto onto your computer. I can just get it right here on my iPad. We can go com directly from my iPad. Just <laughs> so they're always thinking about two steps ahead of me, or they'll say, now, I think I can do this. Can I? And I'll, oh, I'm sure. Yes, I'm sure that's what you can do. So. Um, they always surprise me with what they're capable of doing. Uh, what I learned about myself is it's probably just best for me to get out of the way and let them go. You did a great job. Thank you, kids. Great job. <laughs> Bill, can we ask Judy questions? Judy? Regarding the, the whole push towards more integration, um, caravans is the example. That was for all the, s all the fourth grades across the district, is Correct. that right? Correct. And can you talk a little bit about how you continue to push to accelerate that, and is the plan to go K-4 or more 4-8, or, or what's, what is the future? I mean, it's fantastic, and kudos to you and the team. What's the future look like? Well, really, you know, as, as I mentioned in the, in the report, there's, this is taking on a lot of different, um, it's looking at different in different grade levels, but teachers are naturally seeing these connections, and so they're coming to us and saying, you know, can we have release time to work on these? Seventh and eighth grade just did a whole big social studies rewrite of their curriculum map. So as, um, and Common Core is also driving this quite a bit, but our, our goal is to always have more and more going on every year. So we're hoping, I would say, by the end of next year, and not just in social studies, but to have more integrated units across, across every grade level. Thank you, it's fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> the next report is on the Mandarin Immersion Program. Mr. Simmick. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. And Mr. Moline is going to uh, present, and one of the things that is important prior to this is uh, this, because of the uh, amount of work that the, the district has been doing related to the uh, immersion program this year, I think it's safe to say that we could go on for several days <coughs> discussing uh, the related <coughs> items uh, to, uh, to the immersion program. So we're going to actually bound the discussion uh, to its original intent, which was a review of two important aspects. Uh, last year, about this time, the board uh, took a look at a couple things. One of those was a satisfaction survey from parents. Were parents uh, being delivered uh, a product that, that they were interested in? And in this, uh, this year, in response to a, a good deal of of staff uh, discussion and input, a uh, real uh, dive into math achievement. So a look at the student achievement for this year and also uh, the, the uh, responses to our uh, survey on uh, parental satisfaction are gonna be the two topics that Mr. Moline is gonna address tonight for us. Okay, good evening, thank you Mr. Simic. Um, but just one comment first. Why must I always follow such cute and amazing <laughs> children in my report? <laughs> um, all right. Um, with that, um, so as, as uh, Superintendent Simic shared, uh, 
the purpose of this is really to organize, analyze, share information and feedback uh, to decision makers as well as those who are responsible for implementation of uh, the, the immersion program. It's in its uh, closing its second year now, so it's still a fairly new program, and so we still feel uh, that there are areas where we, we, we can potentially refine and improve, and so that's kind of the purpose of this. Um, the Cherokee Family Survey, uh, as, as Superintendent Simic mentioned, is actually broader than uh, just a question of the immersion program, but my focus today is upon the uh, questions and items that, that pertain to that particular program. And uh, uh, Karen Segalis, I want to right away say that uh, she mm -hmm. was my collaborator on this project, uh, teacher at Cherokee School and also an administrative intern, and, and I think added a lot of value to the project uh, with really great questions, really great thinking, and just insights into uh, the way things work in the school. Okay, so two main topics today is to look at the Cherokee Family Survey, again, focusing on the responses of families who indicated that they were part of the immersion program, as well as an analysis of student achievement in second grade, the second grade cohort in terms of mathematics um, are my two main focus areas for tonight. Okay, uh, there were uh, 95 respondents who did indicate that they currently have students in the immersion program. And I would say my primary finding, if I had to crunch it down for you um, in the, the simplest way possible, is that I found that there were very high levels of satisfaction with and, and commitment to the immersion program among these uh, respondents. Um, so for example, 96% of respondents indicated that they were fully committed to the program. 80% admitted, uh, uh, indicated that they were fully satisfied with the program. So that is really quite encouraging that uh, those who are part of the immersion program are really feeling that it's uh, a beneficial uh, program for their, for their students and that it's uh, meeting their needs and meeting uh, what their expectations were. Um, some other things that we asked, and I just want to share briefly, uh, we asked uh, what, what is the primary reason why you elected to choose uh, this, this um, program? And the primary reason that I found was um, parents really wanted to seize the opportunity to learn a second language at a young age. Um, so some indicated that that's a time when the brain is very plastic, that's a time, great opportunity to learn a language. And so that was kind of the, the primary reason indicated, or they just really see the value of a second language. And so that was really the main reason. Uh, there were other reasons cited, but that was the top reason of why um, parents are particularly interested in this program. Um, we also wanted to uh, find out a little bit more about uh, um, is the program drawing parents to Lake Forest? And it, it seems that uh, yes, it is in a sense. 22.6% uh, uh, of these respondents did indicate that the program was a factor in their move to Lake Forest. So it is something that's actually um, attracting parents. Um, now, uh, one, uh, and also uh, we asked questions about the bus service, for example, and that seems to be something that's uh, you know working for families as well. Um, and uh, I would just like to share uh, an interesting and important side finding, which we're going to focus more on tomorrow and uh, on Thursday in our parent input meetings, which is that uh, um, satisfaction and sentiments at Cherokee School right now are um, somewhat different as a function of the program. Um, so um, uh, if, if students are in uh, the, the English, the traditional program, they're maybe a little bit less satisfied as a whole right now, and that's something that uh, that we want to focus on and really work on in our parent input meetings. Okay. All right. Uh, the second uh, piece that I wanted to share tonight had to do with an analysis of student math achievement, uh, and I focus specific specifically on the second grade cohort of students at Cherokee School. Um, and the idea was to uh, examine existing data in, uh, in math in order to better understand student achievement and progress for students who are part participating in the program versus those who are not. Um, and math, uh, we felt, was a, uh, a particularly important, interesting area to choose because uh, math instruction is delivered wholly um, within the immersion program now. And that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of the unique feature of immersion programs, by the way, versus uh, more traditional world language programs, is that you're actually teaching content while you're teaching the language. And uh, the, the primary content area that's being taught um, during our immersion program is uh, mathematics. So um, it just raises some interesting questions. Is it working, you know, basically? And so we felt like it was important to look at that. Um, second grade, we felt like was a good grade to choose because uh, we do have a little bit more um, 
uh, ability to look at different measures at that grade level. We also have students that have been in the program for two years now, so we, in some cases we could actually look longitudinally at first and second grade achievement. These are some of the measures we use. Uh, we relied upon uh, Ames Web measures. Uh, MCAP is the measures of concepts and applications. Uh, we did it in a timed and an untimed format. We also use math computation. That's another Ames Web measure, and that's a little more like basic skills based. Um, um, and uh, a couple other things I wanted to look at was explore enrichment identification because these second graders are now being identified for, for that program for, for the subsequent school year. I wanted to look at how was that across uh, the Mandarin program and the, um, and the traditional program. And I also wanted to look at the special needs uh, distribution. Um, those are some of the main things I looked at in the report. And uh, my report sometimes, my reports are sometimes lengthy and tedious and whatnot, but I wanted to try to crunch it down to, um, for at least for this um, to what I feel are some of the key, the key findings. Um, first of all, second, second grade math achievement and growth at Cherokee Elementary School, I found to be overall, with some variability, it, it, depending on the different measure you were looking at, overall comparable across both instructional formats, where um, in most cases differences in performance between the Mandarin, or the Mandarin programming and the traditional programming were not statistically significant. Um, second grade math achievement and growth, moreover, when you look at Cherokee as a whole and compare it to the district as a whole, um, was also comparable to what you're seeing in the district as well. Um, and to me, uh, that, that is just showing uh, what I would hope that it would show uh, would be that uh, we have an integrity of programming in both formats and we're achieving uh, the excellent results that you come to expect in both formats in mathematics. Um, with respect to the distribution of students who are eligible for gifted programming, I found, uh, again, quite a quite a balance between the two programs. I think uh, in second grade, uh, the immersion program comprises about 44% of the total population and uh, students who are eligible for gifted uh, programming out of that program comprise about 40 to 44% of the population. So it's really about what you would expect. Um, and uh, so I'd, I'm not seeing something where, you know, a big imbalance in terms of that distribution either. Um, Another side finding I wanted to point out to you uh, was something that I found to be really exciting and a, and a, a really powerful finding uh, was that the Tier 2 programming that is in place, uh, has been in place since early December with math, really did provide a tremendous boost to several students and it actually got them to the point where they were commensurate with their, or very close to being commensurate with their peers, the average scores. Um, and I just, I really like to see that and I really wanted to, you know, heap praise and compliments onto the teachers that made that happen. Um, and it really makes a big difference for the kids. Okay, um, so generally speaking, I guess, um, I found uh, results to be quite encouraging uh, with respect to the immersion program, that it is something that parents are very satisfied with, very committed to. Um, certainly I did uncover uh, certain little, um, uh, things, uh, suggestions that I did make within my report, uh, ways that we can refine and continue in to improve, but I did find it to be, um, you know, a program that people are very satisfied with and, um, and again, committed to. And I also uh, was pleased to find that the math, uh, math results for these students uh, was uh, generally commensurate with what uh, would happen in the um, traditional program as well. Um, and then I, you know, I think a lot of this that goes, goes together with other things that we're looking at in terms of, you know, um, uh, finances of the program and things like that. So this is just kind of a small picture um, of the um, of the big of the overall. But I hope that this is helpful. You know, as we um, go into our parent input meetings, and I hope it's helpful for you, just kind of seeing uh, a snapshot of what's going on in the immersion program and how parents are feeling about it. Thanks very much, Joe. You're welcome. Um, are there board members who have questions? I have one quick question. As a realtor in town. Um, mm -hmm. The comment that 22% mm -hmm. of the respondents mm -hmm. suggested they moved to Lake Forest as a result of the Mandarin program, that's 21 families that moved into the area? Uh, I believe that that was the response. Yeah, I can uh, look that up to be sure. But um, yeah, there was actually a direct question. Um, you know, was the Mandarin program a factor in your move to Lake Forest? And there was a certain number, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but a certain number said, yes, it was. Right, yep. We need to get that in our realty uh, yeah. marketing <laughs> materials as soon as possible. <laughs> okay. The um, other question I would have is, 
mm-hmm. and this is not completely off topic, but mm-hmm. based on your findings, how would you define success relative mm-hmm. to what you've reported? Would you suggest we're succeeding mm-hmm. from your perspective and also maybe from the parents' perspective in terms of yeah. the math findings and things like that? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I think that's I think that's like the heart of the the heart of the question. I guess I I would say um, success in terms of uh, student student uh, academic achievement in the in the key academic areas that we we care about. Uh, yes, I would say that we it appears that we are succeeding in those areas. Um, from the uh, my definition would be that we're achieving at least as well as as we would in the traditional program or com- comparable w- would be my definition. Of course, that could be contested, but as well as um, that we're delivering that. Uh, uh, world language um, as well. You know, we're we're delivering that extra language as well. And then I, to me, part of success as well though would be um, uh, parent satisfaction, staff satisfaction, um, uh, and uh, I would say on that measure, uh, perhaps we have room to grow. Um, not necessarily with within the um, parents of the immersion program, although we do have. I think we always have room to grow, and there's some room to grow there too. Um, but we do have room to grow in terms of the overall. Um, climate, culture and climate right now, um, uh, I think in the, uh, the broader system, and that's kind of the purpose of our meetings on uh, tomorrow and Thursday. So on that measure, I'd say no, we're not succeeding, um, but on the measure of what's actually happening with the students in terms of their learning and, and, uh, and the parent satisfaction of those who are part of the program, I'd say uh, my, my definition would be yes. I don't know if that's a good answer or not. No, yeah. that, that's great, thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, Joe, I got a Sarcastic. couple questions. Um, mm-hmm. One kind of a detailed in the bowels of your mm. analysis, which is fantastic. Yeah. And I should start, kudos to you and Andy and Karen Segalis. It's, mm. uh, it's a lot of great work that went into this, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, you, you mentioned that vocabulary and certain math concepts are a struggle mm-hmm. to be taught and learned in Mandarin. And so if I read it correctly, some of them are being taught in English as well, sort of in parallel. Mm-hmm. Um, is that is an overstatement, are we moving towards sort of a modified immersion program mm-hmm. and what's being, what is not being taught that would otherwise be taught as we're sort of teaching things in parallel? Yeah, yeah, that, okay, I'm gonna let Dr. Henriksen answer that. Yep. I was looking around to see if Carolyn Cromus was here because Carolyn actually is the expert on the development of curriculum. But, uh, you know, we test our kids beginning in second grade on the NWA a map s- test. And what we were concerned about in that regard was that the math terminology that is on the NWA, um, square, rectangle, uh, prism, these words would not be known in English to the students. So we wanted to make sure that that vocabulary was also taught in English. Not necessarily as much the concepts, but the vocabulary. So you're not necessarily worried that time is being spent that should be spent on some LA topic or something? Um, you know, it's always a balance. Every, everything you do takes away from something else, but um, it's important that the kids understand that terminology. The other question while you're up here, um, I thought the information on the Tier 2 math was fantastic, and I, I agree wholeheartedly. I know I've heard Mike Semick talk about math being sort of different than other topics because when you're on a track, it's really hard to get to a higher track, and, and so it's critically important that the kids don't fall behind and uh, so I kind of want to understand math, tiered math started in December, I think. Is that available for all students K-4 across the district? Will it be available for all students K-4 across the district going forward? The, there's different interventions going across each of the three buildings. The tiered math that you're speaking of was something that the Cherokee teachers uh, identified that certain kids needed and then certain teachers stepped up and delivered that. So as far as a systematic program, no, but I know that it, it's important to all teachers when they recognize that their students are not meeting the standards of a grade level or, or you know, keeping up with their, their content learning, that they remediate. So there is no system like we have uh, for Team Read, for example, in reading. Um, and obviously I'm new up here. Uh, why is there no systematic tiered math like there is in reading? I suppose, uh, you know, resources and just something that we felt like we were handling with differentiation. Um, Team Read is, is a systematic program that, s- I guess, some districts I d- have reading specialists that work just with certain kids. 
our team read uh, personnel are infused for half an hour a day to work with all students. So that, you know, during that half an hour a day, the special ed teacher, the classroom teacher, and a reading uh, assistant for them all work together, divvying up the, the students in one of the classrooms to deliver that in, in specialized instruction so that all the students in the class get small group, shared reading, and content-driven skill stuff for that half an hour a day. So it's not, I mean, it is an intervention because oftentimes the reading specialist will take the students that are of most need, but it's something that all students receive. Uh, thank you. I guess I would encourage you and us as we're moving forward with you know, yeah. budgets and you mentioned resources and maybe it's something that we should consider, but thank you. Thank you. And I guess my last comment, more for the board, understanding the, the constraints sort of of time and, and this discussion as it relates to the presentation. I guess um, as we talk about Mandarin, it's not a Cherokee issue, it's a district issue and, and we'll talk about that more uh, as the week goes on. Um, the question of vision, how does it fit within the district's vision, does it fit within the district's vision? I'm not sure that's ever really been asked and clearly answered and we're not gonna answer it or discuss it tonight. Um, I think it should be and to parents in the program, I'm not suggesting that it should or should not be. I just think it's a discussion that we should have. Uh, further, I'd say to parents in the program, in my opinion, we have a commitment to you. You've been in the program, we have a commitment, but I don't believe that we have a commitment beyond that without asking the vision question. Um, as it impacts the culture of the district, as we look at all three elementary schools. So without going further, I'd ask our board president, I'd like to see uh, a formal agenda item if we could, either at a future board of ed meeting or at a board of ed workshop. But I'd formally like the, this board to discuss that topic, particularly before we start trying to develop long-term solutions. I think this board needs to discuss how it fits within our district. That seems like a real good idea, thank you. I believe uh, two other people said they had questions. Mr. Lemke? Joe, um, I'll ask you uh, two questions. Um, the first is, what are your thoughts about how we could improve the random sampling? So you read the report and 95% of Mandarin parents are replying and 30% of traditional are replying. So as a district, have we, have we thought about how to get a better sample? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a great question and that is something that caused me to be cautious in interpreting the results. Um, you know, I, um, is, is uh, old fashioned as this sounds, I think just getting the word out in as many ways as possible is, is the answer that I've always been told, you know. Um, uh, you know, uh, I guess we probably relied on the uh, e-newsletter primarily this time and maybe, uh, maybe uh, we can rethink uh, to some extent how do, we, how do we get information to all the people and make sure that, you know, everyone takes, takes the survey. Um, I, I think, uh, I don't know if I presented this during the report or not, but what I ended up finding was that the responsiveness uh, or respondents uh, out of the immersion families, uh, it was a much higher rate than in the uh, traditional programming. And so that did cause me to be a little bit cautious and or quite a bit cautious in terms of interpreting the results. So yeah, it is something we need to, I guess, think about how do we get the, get the vote out or whatever, as you, as you say. My, my other question would be concerning um, mm -hmm the baseline data. So mm -hmm. the selection problem that we're worried about mm -hmm. um, regarding math growth and math development, mm -hmm. it's, it's tricky and you mentioned in, in the report yeah. how tricky it is and mm -hmm. it, it is tricky, yeah. but it's a lot less tricky with baseline data. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so what are the district's mm -hmm. plans for, I mean you gotta test kindergartners, you mm -hmm. gotta test them in the fall yeah. and you gotta yeah. be able to link that data. So what are the plans yeah. for that? Yeah, yeah, and I, it was probably a little bit misleading for me to state that you know second grade is really where we're data rich and I think that is true that we're a little bit more data rich as you go up in the grade levels, but actually in grade K we, d we are you know screening students upon entry and uh, we have various ways that we can collect baseline data. Um, in this case I kind of grabbed onto what I felt was a uh, uh, interesting question, interesting grade level, but we could certainly uh, evaluate looking at right from the day one of when students come into the program on certain measures. So that is a definite, it, it is something we can do uh, is we can start at the baseline and work our way up with students. So, 
Mr. Simmons? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if this is for uh, Mr. Moline, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Hendrickson, or Ms. Sigalis on this, but on, uh, there's a graph on page nine, uh, the MCOMP benchmark achievement is by tier, and the blue line is for those not participating in tier two, so those not getting additional assistance with math, and in the fall, there was about a 13 point gap uh, or 15 point gap between those two. And the good news on that, and something you mentioned in your report, Mr. Moline, mm -hmm. was that in the springtime when those two mm -hmm. uh, groups were assessed on the MCOMP benchmark, uh, those tier two kids had completely closed that gap. Yeah. And the, the board has is is just recently gone through its budget, the beginning uh, phases of its budget and could you talk about the resources that the district directs mm -hmm. at uh, this kind of achievement gap closing yep yeah yeah uh, first off I would just like to say that um, this is the kind of thing that gets me really excited <laughs> um, very, uh, uh, basic, basically uh, it's very rare that you see a graph that looks like that I mean this is just great um, and so yes it is something we really need to be pouring research I mean this if we're gonna spend money on something this would be a good thing to spend it on right um, so um, ways that we do that you know we invest in high quality research based programs for example uh, that's you know that comes out of the curriculum budget uh, other ways we do that is uh, for example we might run a tier 2 program before or after school and then we pay uh, the teacher or teachers for their time in doing that. So those are a couple examples of how we um, support and encourage that type of programming uh, because uh, some part of it is finding time and sometimes you do have to be creative and do it outside of the school day. So the staff identifies students that mm -hmm. are, are struggling to mm -hmm. some extent and then there are resources that are directed at those students and then the, the achievement is then monitored. Okay. Um, and Dr. Hendrickson just whispered into my ear that this, in this case, this was actually done for free on teacher time. So sometimes we have just really altruistic uh, people that really want to make a difference and they do it too. And I think that should be recognized too, so. And I recognize some mm -hmm. vigorous head nodding from <laughs> uh, our teacher in the audience there. So thank you very much, Mr. Sigalis. This is really an astonishing thing to see that gap completely closed at the end. Very neat and tidy and mm -hmm. uh, exciting too. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was, thank you. And I would second that to the teachers on their free time. I think that's fantastic and hugely admirable. I'm not sure I think that's the right answer, mm -hmm. but I think it's fantastic that the teachers are doing that. Absolutely. Mr. Malin and Dr. Hendrickson, thank you very much. Thank you. The next report is the proposal for late arrival at DPM for 2013-2014. Uh, this report is actually, we're gonna postpone this because this is actually an agenda item um, later on in a, among our action items. Uh, looking for it, uh, item G on our action item. So we are going to uh, take a rain check on this one for the moment. Okay, we now come to board committees, uh, the first being the Board Education Committee, which uh, Mrs. Fisher has agreed to uh, stay on as chairman of. Uh, and Leslie, do you have a report? I actually have no report for this evening as we have not met since our last board meeting. But I did want to say many thanks to both Bill Anderson and Rick Schuler for previously serving alongside myself on the Board Education Committee and I am looking forward to working with Jeff Volker and Beth Clemenson and having their wisdom along for the ride. And we will look forward to reconvening in the fall. And you're also, you'll note in your Friday flyers that um, there is an opening on the Board Education Committee for a community member. So we encourage all of those interested to apply. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And it was great um, serving on that committee and it's really a place to learn the most about uh, education and how the district uh, district works. The um, next committee is the Finance and Operations Committee, uh, which Rick Schuler is has taken over the chairman of chair of. Um, Rick, do you have a report? No, I do not. We have not met since the last board meeting. We're looking at meeting in the second or third week of July. 
Thank you very much. We now come to organizations um, in which uh, a member of the board serves as a liaison. The first one is the North Suburban Special Education District. Uh, Mike Borkowski. Uh, we do not have a report for the NSSED. Thank you. Uh, next is the Illinois Association of School Be Boards and Ed Red. Uh, Bill Anderson. Um, there is no report. Uh, next is the Curriculum Coordinating Committee. Uh, Leslie Fisher. No report. Try again. Spirit of 67 Foundation, Leslie Fisher. I have to say something because I can't keep saying nothing. Uh, the Spirit of 67 Foundation, although there is no formal report, I do want to report that on May 2nd, the Spirit held their 11th home tour and it was yet another success. And um, a lot of you were there helping out. A lot of you were there helping out. And to everyone, those watching, many of our community came out to enjoy the day. And those funds that are, th are that are raised for such a fun, wonderful afternoon, all go directly towards grants used in our classrooms. Um, what, what is the motto? Every kid, every day, something like that. So um, it was a wonderful thing to be a part of. Thanks, Leslie. Are there any other organizations that anyone has uh, partaken <laughs> of? on part of the board, <laughs> which they would like to report on. Hearing none, uh, we move to our action items, of which there are a number. The first one being the approval of the GCA renewal. Mr. Simic. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, this is our cleaning contract, and uh, Mrs. Hermes has an update on that. In addition uh, to that, uh, there's a little bit of background to be given on this renewal. Thank you, Mr. Simic. If you think this list is long, wait till June. Um, <laughs> just a little bit of background on, on GCA. Um, for those of you that may be wondering, wait a minute, I thought we had our own custodians as employees. That is true. GCA is our contracted cleaning service, and primarily they work our second shift. So they do some of our deeper cleaning that we're really not able to do when our, our buildings are fully occupied. So that's the service we're referring to. Um, GCA has been in the district since at least 2006, and I know that because that's when I came. I'm not sure how long they were here before that. The entire program was rebid in 2009, and that was um, done with an option to renew annually for up to four years, as I've indicated in the memo. Um, one of the things that we've been really pleased about with GCA is they've really worked in partnership with us um, on a lot of different things. They have relatively low turnover. Now, in our bid, we do require some minimum wages and some minimum insurance coverages to prevent turnover, and that has worked very successfully. Um, they help us fill in on our staffing levels. For example, when Mother Nature decides to give us a nice little white blanket, many of our guys will be pushed to the outside, leaving um, our building somewhat unfilled if we didn't call in the second shift guys to come in immediately and fill that first shift. So they've been very responsive in that, in that manner. They've also uh, filled in when we have um, maybe some long-term absences due to medical or other reasons. So um, we feel that they've really been a partner with us on keeping our buildings well staffed. Um, the service, um, by the basis of the bid and how it was put together, will be rebid next spring. Um, it, is, it is due this year. Uh, this contract is approximately 511000 and some change, and this is a 2%, basically a cost of living increase um, from last year, or um, for the number of people, that's an increase of $10,203. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. Questions from board members or superintendents? How happy have we been with them, and why? Absolutely, positively thrilled. They really, they really have been great. Um, not so much here at 67, but even at the high school, when we really had to kind of um, look at at each and every one of our contracts, and we were looking actually to reduce services to reduce costs. Um, they really were willing to work with us to still maximize our buildings, get the the, the best cleaning efficiency with a little harm um, to the actual operation of the building. So they were a partner. They didn't just take our suggestions. They just didn't implement their own, but they listened to what we were trying to achieve, which was a reduction in cost to still provide us the best possible service. Are there other questions? If there are none, uh, may I have a, uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the presentation. And may I have a motion to approve the GCA renewal? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk. Mr. Schuler. 
Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Motion carries. We are going, thank you. We are going to deviate slightly from the agenda and move item G up to item B, if you're keeping score, um, because there are people here who are going to um, talk about that. So the next item will be the approval of Deer Path Middle School late start proposal. Dr. Hendrickson. Thank you. I want to introduce a few people that were help, uh, very helpful in uh, bringing this proposal together. Uh, Christy Thies is the new APT president at uh, DPM. Gloria Malazuski, world language teacher. Ben Gray, uh, LFEA vice president. And of course, uh, we have the uh, Rene DeVore, principal here. So we're all here to answer questions about this proposal. Really what we're asking you to do today is give us a license to do a pilot. Um, as you know, K-4 teachers each Monday are dis uh, dismiss students early by an hour to work together. Um, it's on a rotation so that every, every basically every four weeks you have a, a building meeting, so building agenda changes occur. Uh, you have a grade level team meeting that meets across the grade level to look at common core or changes that we have district wide. You have a small team meeting so the third grade teachers at Everett would work together. Um, and, and you typically you have a, an opportunity to do a data dive where uh, student, student achievement is looked at so we can figure out who is needing additional help. So that's occurring every week in the elementary school. Deer Path teachers don't have the opportunity to work campus-wide. Um, when, when a group of teachers has a planning period, all the other teachers, of course, are teaching to accommodate the students. So we have a number of needs that we would like to address, th the first of which is capturing kids' hearts. We've probably sent, Julie, 40, 40 staff members maybe? Yeah. About 40 staff members from the district to the Flippin' Groups training, Capturing Kids' Hearts. It's a three-day training. It's very expensive. Every single member of the faculty or administration that's come back has said, best training ever. So tell us about it. How can we get together and do something with this? How can we move our organization forward? I don't know. You, you just have to experience it is, is the uh, most frequent response. Well, it could take us a number of years to get every, every teacher to that three-day training. And so we're looking towards how can we build critical mass a little bit quicker and having a two-hour early release three times throughout the year would be the first way we would like to, to develop change at DPM. Capturing Kids Hearts is about connecting personally with kids, motivating them more strongly through stronger relationships between teachers and students. And, and again, the, the teachers that have gone to this training have said, wow, this has changed me. And we want a bit of that experience for all DPM teachers. And so to bring together a uh, trainer of trainers, th these teachers that have gone to this training and have them teach others during these times would be the first and probably the most important need we have for that cross-campus training. Now, you know we have two training days in, in August and one institute day during the year and by golly we've had a ton of things to go over common core uh, danielson um, 21st century differentiation we've had a lot of things to cover with teachers and we will continue to have a lot of things to cover in those those time periods so we could do without this no question but i guess we're here today to tell you if if you approve this proposal we'll make it meaningful we, we will come back to you in April and May with results of parent, student, and teacher surveys, as well as a report on what we accomplished during these three days. We looked at the high school schedule. They have six of these late arrivals uh, throughout the year, and we tagged on to three of them to be a little bit less impactful to some of our families who may have a high school student who could either transport or supervise the middle school children. Um, we will promise to look into various ways of having some sort of uh, before school care, well, you know, 8.15 to 10.30-ish care for students of dual working parents that don't have options. And that could be through CROIA staff coming over, brainstormers classes that are sponsored by parents, 
or even high school students could somehow be involved in leading these because, again, these are early release date or late arrival days for the uh, high school kids. The other thing we looked at was what's better, early release or late arrival? And we, we came and met with the Deer Path a APT and the strong um, sentiment from them was late arrival is much easier on working parents, much easier to go in a little bit late than to leave at 1.30 or 2.30 in the afternoon. So the other, the other piece that, uh, you know what, I'm going to have Christy Tice talk to you about that a little bit instead of stealing her thunder. Sorry, Christy. Thanks, Andy. I'm going to have to lower this down just a little bit. Um, first of all, I'm Christy Tice, for those of you that I have not had the opportunity to meet yet. And I am thrilled to be the incoming APT president here at DPM. I've got some tough shoes to fill here with Diana Kreiling, but I am just thrilled with the opportunity to serve. Um, and with regard to what's being proposed, at one of our most recent meetings that Diana was running, we did bring up the issue of either the early dismissal or the late arrival initiative. And like Andy was mentioning, it was unanimously, almost unanimous, that parents preferred to have their children come in late. Um, as Andy was also talking about, we are discussing a number of options if people, if parents are in need of child care. In fact, Diana and I are meeting tomorrow with Todd Nahigian at Croya to see if there would be some possible programs that may be led by Croya. Um, and also, we will talk to the APT, to parents in our district, to see what help we might be able to garner from our APT. Um, and second of all, the parents of the district, at least those that were represented at our meeting, strongly were in favor of this, this initiative as long as we could come back and see measurable success from um, the activities that were planned by the teachers. So that's our voice for the parents. Thank you. I just, I just want to speak to something as well. Um, you know, at the beginning of the year, coming in as a new principal, I met with uh, each of the teachers for a half hour. We did an interview, and one of the main points that came from the teachers was that they wanted professional development time. I can, s I can s uh, honestly say that um, a lot of great stuff has happened at DPM this year um, with regard to the Holocaust Immersion Project, which I know you're all familiar with. Um, and other, uh, other things that have happened with regards to STEM and the integration, that Holocaust Immersion Project just basically opened the floodgates with regards to ideas. Um, and, and the teachers are doing this really on their own time. I mean, a lot of the meetings that were happening for the Holocaust Project were happening at 7.30 in the morning, were happening after school, were happening on their planned time, in addition to what their regular duties were. Um, so this is really, this idea of this late arrival, three days in the year, is a stepping stone. Um, they really want it. I'm, th you know, Mr. Gray and Mrs. Malazuski are here, um, but I think it is an important point uh, for our teachers and um, to make sure that they continue. I don't want them to get burned out of all the the things that they're excited about right now and doing that on their own time. So to be able to have some additional time to be able to work on these projects, um, I think is really significant and important. So to your point, Renee, what you just said about the fact of, as you met one-on-one, -on -one, they really want this time for collegiality and mm -hmm. to work on things, and certainly during negotiations, Ben, we, we heard this loud and clear, mm -hmm. very important to the teachers that they have some time throughout the school year, throughout the school day, mm -hmm. to meet with um, fellow team members uh, and even cross-team. Because you are taking on this initiative of the flip and training, will there be time to do a little bit of both? Will there be time to certainly implement and learn this program and implement it and study it in the correct way, meaning the flipping program, but will there also be additional time wherein teachers can meet across teams, maybe with teachers who they wouldn't ordinarily meet with, like we've heard from Judy Epke today, mm -hmm. interdisciplinary ideas, how they could take flight. Will there be any time for that this year? Would that be something moving forward? Well, this is just an addition. So those three days would just be an addition to what they're already doing. So being able to give them that time. Andy's correct when, when um, the teachers have come back from this training. There is so much excitement and enthusiasm that they want to go right to their teams. I think w the last training was maybe in April, and even though it was towards the end of the school year, teachers went into the classroom and implemented it right away. Um, so that, again, is just three, three days outside of what they normally would do, and they still have time to work across their own teams. 
um, working across the department and grade level and whatnot is a little bit more difficult. Um, that Holocaust immersion project that the eighth grade had to work on, again, they had to work on that all on their own time. But again, we hope that um, through this year and those few days that maybe this will be a stepping stone to future professional development. And the teachers are also in the process right now at looking more creatively how they can use the time that they currently have and how they can make the best use of that time as, as, as well. For those three days, would the schedule for those three days be a compressed regular classroom schedule or yes. would there be an absence of first two periods? Uh, I think it's going to be a compressed schedule, but not, not, sh not completely certain about that. Um, you know, the other, the other thing I should mention is within the teacher's contract, um, there, there is an option to do this outside of the, the teacher's day, although it's very expensive and, and we can't mandate it. So for example, this summer, as, as you probably know, we have uh, between 90 and and $100,000 of summer curriculum work, and we pay that at either $36 or $48 an hour, depending on you know, whether they're learning or uh, creating. And if this were even at the learning rate to, to gather the staff at BPM across the campuses, um, that would be $21,000 for these six hours. And we couldn't require them to come after school, even if you know, even if so we could. So it, I'm hoping you'll say yes to this pilot. It's not something that we're going to say forever and ever, but we want to come back and be able to prove to you that, that it was valuable. Andy, uh, thank you for talking about the contract because one of my questions is going to be what other alternatives are there, and obviously you just, you just answered that. I'm a little conflicted. Um, I absolutely think that the professional development part is fantastic, everything that you said. I'm also worried that it's direct instruction time being reduced mm -hmm. to on the kids' side of things. Um, so you've mentioned a couple times that it's a pilot. You mentioned in your report that we've seen institute days somewhat be taken by other things that come up. Danielson. Right. 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 Uh, so I have a little niggling concern that that could happen with this. Um, and I'm sure you're going to do everything in your power to make sure it doesn't. I, I guess. I'd like to hear about what the measures of success are now mm -hmm. and then hear what the answers are to them in April. I, I'd rather than next April say, here's what we decided the measures of success are. Can you talk to what success looks like? Well, you know, we, capturing kids' hearts would be our first choice for at least two of these three days. Uh, part of that is contingent upon whether or not we could get the flipping group here during the August Institute days so that they could do a half day for all teachers so they could have that intro first and then we could follow up throughout the year on the changes that we propose campus-wide. So Julie Cooley's been helping me arrange for them to come in August, but th they haven't signed off yet. So if they do, that'll be our plan A, capturing kids' hearts. And we'll probably develop a survey around that or use our social, uh, what's it called, Joe? The uh, school-wide school-wide social behavior a survey that we do every year to, to talk to you know some of the issues about connectedness of kids at school things like that if we can't do capturing kids hearts then one of the things that we would fall back on is the development of integrated units in each of the grade levels again the Holocaust unit was just a, a tremendous experience for those that were participating and they did all the planning before school because that's the only time that teachers across eighth grade, wellness, fine arts, all of them had free time. Well, it was their own time. So that would be a great fallback for us to then come back to you in April or May and say, hey, as a result of that two hours, those three times, we planned a fifth grade, a sixth grade, a seventh grade, and an eighth grade integrated unit that we implemented in April, and here's how it went. So I, I think what we're looking to do is to make this you know, a, a yearly thing. And the best way for us to do that is to make sure that what we use those hours for is really big and impactful and noticeable. So that that's our commitment. So could you, because I understand what you said, there's some things still in flux, but, mm -hmm. but if we uh, vote to approve this tonight, mm -hmm. I'm uncomfortable waiting till April to hear the readout. Could we kind of agree that September, October, you come back and say, Here's what the measures of success are going to be. Absolutely, great idea. I should have put that in the report. Yep. I just want to take Mike's point a little further. <clears throat> I agree, and I think we all agree as well, that 
the professional development, the benefit from it is, is a very positive thing. But it, it's also hard to measure the, the negative, the cost, the mm -hmm. expense of the kids missing out on more hours of education and the disruption to the families that uh, right. either have to bring their kids late or pick them up early. And my other concern is that w if this continues, you know, where do you draw the line? You know, we had these three days, we had three more days. Um, for instance, at the elementary schools on Mondays, the, the school day ends an hour and 10 minutes early. And I, I know a lot of parents have uh, trouble with that because it's, it's a different schedule, mm -hmm. uh, not to mention the fact that the kids are getting one hour less of education. So I, I, I just want everybody to think about this because there are, there's more than one expense offsetting uh, even a measurable benefit. Right. And there are alternatives. Now, unfortunately, uh, I think you answered the question in a way that sort of makes it difficult to try any of the other options because it's contractual. But you know, there's before school, there's after school, there's Saturdays, there's other times that this could happen. And I think that's a little troubling to mm -hmm. not just me. Mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, as of right now, I think this is a great starting point. It's three two hour periods during an entire school year. It's a very, very small, in my opinion, fragment of time that we're looking at. Very different from what the elementary school model is. Something that I support, but that I recognize really hampers parents' ability to have a full day and can sometimes seem um, troublesome to people that students are released an hour and 10 minutes early, as you said, every single Monday. But we're talking about three specific days earmarked for either one of these two projects to work on that we're going to be hearing progress on now midway through or beginning and then towards the end as well. So in my opinion, it's a very, very small start. And I do use the word start because perhaps at the end of next year, they will say we need five days. And we could, and then we can reevaluate at that point. Yeah. I'd just like to make one more comment about making sure that we're really communicating with our parents in terms of what they can expect our teachers to get a value out of that time. Um, we all know that that Monday early dismissal is important for our teachers, but a lot of parents don't really understand what our teachers are, are doing during that time. And I just want them to understand that this is something that is gonna benefit their child and making sure, to Mike's point, we have those goals, this is what we're gonna accomplish, and just you know, working through our APT and working through our Friday Flyer to get the word out to parents um, how this is benefiting their children will be important. Uh, and I believe that all of our faculty in District 67, when we enter a professional development time, the underlying goal is how we can improve instruction and classroom environment in our own classroom. So I think our staff would be very excited about these opportunities to have this uh, in the morning on these three days. And I think one of the other things we'd be very excited about is to have a true follow-up from our administrators who will come to us on that second uh, late arrival day and, s and say to us, what have we done with this Capturing Kids Hearts training in our own classroom. I think that is a key piece that has been missing from some of our professional development time that we currently have is that there's not enough follow-up from our administrators as to say, hey Ben, what are you doing here with Edmodo since we started this at the beginning of the year? What have you done with you know, Common Core since we've started at the beginning of the year? And that is, I think, something that we could definitely explain to the community that there's also this piece as well and, and here's how it is improving over the course of the year. Um, I remain skeptical about the three days. I don't think of it as six hours. I think the three days are going to be not as productive as they used to be. So I, I'm concerned about that. But my question actually is about the parents. Uh, we heard people say that the parents were asked, would you rather have early release or late arrival? Were they asked, would you like nothing at all? And which parents were asked? Yeah, we did not do a broad survey, Rob, but we, we did ask the APT uh, um, in a meeting during the day? Yes. So parents who are home during the day got right. asked whether or not they're willing to uh, come two hours late. Yeah. Good point. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, 
If there are no other questions or, or comments, uh, could I have a motion to approve the Deer Path Middle School Late Start proposal? So moved. Second. Could we have a roll call vote? Mr. Borkowski. I'm going to vote in favor for it, and I look forward to understanding the measures. Mr. Lemke. No. Mrs. Clemenson. Uh, yes, with the caveat that we put metrics in place. Mr. Anderson. Aye. Mrs. Fisher. Aye. Mr. Schuler. I'm voting nay. Um, again, I want to say that I think it's huge benefits to this, and I'd like to see more of it, but I'm, I'm just struggling with the timing of it and eating into the kids' uh, hours, and, and I think it's disruptive for the parents. So I want to make it clear I'm voting nay. It's really the timing of it, not, not the actual um, program. Mr. Folker. I vote aye to approve a one-year pilot program. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is item B, which will now be item C. Approval of the Honeywell Instant Alert Contract. Mr. Simic. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, this is the instant alert system that is uh, it can be dialed in by all the parents in the uh, district. They can tailor this to their needs to receive uh, uh, phone calls or text messages or emails as they would like. Uh, a, a testament to Mrs. Whipple's negotiating skill is that in uh, 06 07, the annual fee was uh, $6,750. And uh, this coming school year will be 2,731. Um, and so the, uh, we're negotiating so well that we're starting to get pushback from the company that um, uh, our rates are <laughs> significantly lower than uh, some of our, of our neighbors who also contract with Honeywell. Uh, this is a system that works very, very well for us. And if there are any questions related to um, how often we use it or other things, Mrs. Whipple would be the best person to ask. Board uh, members, are there questions about the instant alert system? Just to clarify, Ann, signing up for the Honeywell instant alert contract, and I did this a long time ago, so I've sort of forgotten, and I feel like, is the could you give us the percentage of the district that is signed up to be a receiver of this instant alert and how we sign up? Absolutely. Um, everyone is enrolled in it with their primary phone number, and we do that at the district level. And then every fall, what we do is a test, if you will, and we try to do it early in the year, September, October. We let parents know that we're testing it. We give them follow-up instructions on how to add their emails, text, grandma's number, the husband's, the wife's number, whatever. I believe it's up to six devices you can put in each one. And then we do the test and wait for calls or concerns after that. Um, but we try to do a uh, quite a bit of pre-publicity in the Friday flyers as well as on the website announcing the test date and the actual time. We do it both with staff and with our families. And then after that, we follow up if we get any calls or questions to make sure that those are rectified before the year goes on. So absolutely everyone is signed up at a very remedial level just with their home phones to start. Easy enough. It looks like you've done fantastic negotiations, so congratulations and thank you for that. Thank you. Um, just sort of from a RFP process, when was the last time it was bidded out and when will the next time it be bidded out? I'm going to defer to Jen for that question. She's our, through the business department. Yes, I, I don't recall when it was formally bid, if it was done initially when the system was put into place. Because of um, the service that it provides, we don't formally or haven't formally rebid it, but I do dipstick in Lake County, which, like I said, Mike has kind of referred to, might make me a little unpopular, because sometimes when I do this, you know, I, I had 17 districts respond within two days of their rates, and then probably half of those said, hey, what are you paying? Um, and then a few responses saying figures. Um, so we do kind of <laughs> informal, 
type of things like that. Um, I like to do it to the Lake County group. They're really well connected. We all have a great response rate because obviously if I'm asking, if the information's important to me, if someone else is asking, the information's important to them. And I don't always get the same districts responding. Um, of those 17 districts, only one was paying a price lower than ours. And of that one, it's a company um, no one has really heard of. They're kind of an up and comer. And, and I, based on the report, I'm not questioning if we're getting a good deal, I'm just more questioning from a process perspective. Why don't we bid it out every X number of years? I, I think it's a combination of two things. One is, is, are we happy and pleased with the service that we have? And consistently, we have been. And two, it's whether or not you think that you're getting a competitive and fair price. Because what would, usually typically you would bid because you're unhappy with your service or you're unhappy with your price or you're concerned that your price isn't more, you know, the most competitive. So we think we're answering both of those two components through our informal process versus a formal process. Could we I did add also too, just to, just to mention, we do other, other things in addition. Um, we did some research into the city's uh, alert system. The name's escaping me, it's like Red Alert or something similar. <laughs> Um, to see whether or not could we uh, piggyback on that. Is that something that we could tie into? Um, however, that was really a municipality, city-based type program. So there wasn't really a, a connection that we could do. We would have to purchase a more of an educational module from them. We also took a look at the existing uh, website or the new website program to see is there any capabilities within that. Um, and at this time, there is not. Thank you. Also, anecdotally, Cornelius and I are contacted, you can imagine, by numerous companies over the year, and we do look at all their products, read through, see if there's any new um, uh, offerings or opportunities, and check redundancy, which is very important to have a redundant site. So though it is anecdotal, we do look at everyone who contacts us and look at their pricing as well as their product offerings. And I just had one question. I, if, if there's a snow day mm -hmm. and then it doesn't snow, um, <laughs> I'd like to defer to Mr. Simic for that <laughs> answer. Is there a way, do we get our money back or something? Or is there a way of correcting that? I would like to thank Mr. Anderson for that <laughs> question. Um, yeah. There are no more questions. And for the record, it did start to <laughs> snow. <laughs> Seeing no more questions. Uh, could I have a proposal to renew the, or a motion to remove the Honeywell instant uh, message alert contract? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Could we have a roll call vote? Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Falker? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. The next item is approval of the waste recycle contract. Mr. Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. This is something that has been a good deal of work since uh, my arrival, actually, in the district. The city has been exploring ways to uh, share resources with the district, and uh, this looked to be uh, the lowest hanging fruit at the time. It has proved to be uh, trickier than than initially uh, anticipated, and so we're actually coming back for a one-year renewal uh, and continued work on trying to partner with the city. It saves money on in two ways. The first way is that uh, the, the, uh, the city pays uh, for fewer pounds at the dump, and then they also get a marginal return on their uh, recycling uh, when they pick up the recycling from from the residents and has been a raging success with the city uh, really really popular and saving significant amounts of money but uh, with more details mr. Hermes uh, mrs. Hermes on that mr. Hermes is in China <laughs> at the moment I believe that's uh, Skype away just a little additional detail I'm not qu quite sure what to say after that um, but you're right, we are working with the city on, on this project, and right now the city is only covering residential um, uh, homes, so they don't really have a commercial or a, you know, a, a facility like ours on their books, and way over my head, but I believe there are ordinances and things like that that they have to uh, address at their level. Um, having said that, we are pleased with the service. I mean, it is um, you know, pretty obvious when you're not getting good service because you will see things pile up. 
But in, in addition, we've also, um, you know, we've had every once in a while, we'll get an occasional call saying, please, can they not pick up so early? <laughs> they're loud, you know, when they're clanging, and, and usually just a quick phone call, and, and they're very responsive. So uh, we've had an occasional, you know, one or two of those over the last couple of years, but, but nothing um, terribly outstanding. Uh, with or without the city, I mean, we're hopeful that something will work out with the city, but even without the city, this um, service is up for bid for next year. Um, we're looking at around $12,000 and a CPI increase of 3%, so um, just a few hundred dollar increase. Happy to answer any other questions board members may have. Seeing no questions, may I have an approval? Uh, may I have a motion to approve the waste recycle contract? So moved. A second? Second. A roll call vote. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Motion carried. We now move on to approval of uh, the Deer Path Middle School Roofing Project bid recommendations. Mr. Simic. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, this is, we do our roofing on a rotating basis, and Mrs. Hermes can uh, give us a little bit broader update on what that looks like for this coming school year, which roofs, and why. Thank you, Mr. Simic. Yes, we do have a, a Deer uh, Path Middle School roof, partial roof replacement plan for this summer. Um, we did um, put formal bids specs on the street, and we did have five contracts submit, contractors submit bids. Um, we are recommending exterior construction specialists in the amount of $83,400 for this project. Just to give you a little background, we do work with a um, specialized roofing consultant. They're um, called RDM. For that, we pay them a consultant type fee. Um, this is a, a, a membrane type roof system. So they do a couple of things. One is they come out and they do our inspections and they meet with Carol and they actually help us grade our roofs, kind of this, you know, similar to student grading, A, B, C, those type of things. So you can kind of give an understanding of which sections of roof are in which forms of disrepair or if they're in decent shape and you can begin to develop your long-term plans. Um, in addition to um, writing our specifications, they also help us with our project estimating, which falls into where um, projects may fit into our five-year plan. And um, more importantly to me, um, they provide all the on-site management. So when this roofing project is actually going on, one, I don't have Carol spending her time on top of the roof, but two, these are people who know specifically about roofs and roofing systems. So they know whether or not the systems are being um, installed according to the manufacturer's specifications, which are really important. Um, these do come, these, these membrane roofs, they come with a 20-year warranty. First two years are covered by the contractor, so it's important that they install them correctly but also the remaining 18 years are covered by the manufacturer. So um, we have used this company before, Exterior Construction Specialist. Carol has been very pleased with their service. And um, we recommend the uh, approval of this bid to them in the amount of 83400 And um, the cost of this project does have a, um, we do pay a 15% fee to RDM consultants for their ongoing work. Jennifer, um, I had read the 15% and I don't, I have, no idea if that's high or low or standard. Can you comment on that? It, it seems high to me, but I have no frame of reference. It kind of varies. If we were to do this through an architect, it would be difficult to say. Their rates may fall more in the range of maybe 8 to 10 or 8 to 12 percent. But in addition to the architect putting together the specifications, we would also be charged time and materials for their engineer. So they would sub it out to an engineer to come on site and to do some of the project management that is included in RDM's 15 percent fee. So it might be half a dozen in one way and six of the other. They say also, I looked at their website just briefly, and they say that they can help with costs and everything and that they have, um, they can get good prices because of their relationship with different contractors and all. So in theory, there's some value from that as well, it seems like. Jennifer, as a fan of RFP bidding processes, I love this, thank you. And particularly since you've already used them and you're comfortable with them, it, might have been easy just to use them again, but I think it was a great process. I'm wondering, uh, how old is the roof? This section of the roof. Do not know that off the top of my head. Tip typically, we, you know, they have about a 20 year life, so, but I don't know the specific section. 
What I do know is if you stay ahead of it and keep it in good repair, you get a lot more life out of the roof. So you, you never know how much life you get, but we gotta stay on top of it. And so it sure seems like we are, so good. Other questions or comments? Hearing none, could I have a motion to approve the Deer Path Middle School Roofing Project bid recommendation? So moved. Second? Second. Um, could I have a roll call vote? Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We move on to the rejection of the Deer Path Middle School tile abatement project or tile abatement bid. Uh, Mr. Simic. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, this uh, is another thing that we could probably be here for at least a day and a half if we wanted to. It uh, brings to a temporary close anyway the ongoing uh, story of the tile abatement project. And Mrs. Hermes can fill us in a little bit more on why we are this time rejecting this bid. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to say I'm really pleased that we work for a, a, an institution that likes to learn because we've learned a lot in this process. Um, this does go back to the Deer Path tile incident and, and even really before that with the Cherokee um, tile that we had or the Cherokee abatement project in which we use a, a citrus mastic re remover. So fast forward, when we did the Deer Path tile project last year, we asked that they use a soy-based product. It did not have the residual odor. Um, however, as many of you are aware, and we've talked about it at several board meetings um, over the past year, um, we did have some, some difficulty with that mastic remo remover sinking, kind of soaking into the concrete, thereby preventing the new tile from adhering properly. So we had pop tiles, and um, we still have some ongoing issues with that. It does look fantastic though now that it is done and anybody that's had an opportunity to see Deer Path, what a difference it really does make. Um, we were um, anticipating doing the other side. We were going to handle some of the abatement and removal of the um, carpet and placing new tile at the east side of the building. <coughs> we decided after the uh, incident at Deer Path last year that we would tighten up the specifications and put much more ownership onto the contractors in their response about some of the things that may occur as part of that process. And so when I say that we learned, what we learned is we had 11 vendors came to the pre-bid meeting. So we bring them in for a pre-bid. It's very common on some of our projects to make sure we can fully discuss, answer all their questions. Everybody's getting the same response at the same time. Um, and although we had 11 um, at the pre-bid, we only received one bid. Now, what we have since learned is they really thought, the other vendors thought that our other speci our specifications were really too res restrictive and that they place an, an inordinate amount of risk on their side. So not only did only one vendor bid, but he also bid a very high price, much higher than our budget. Um, we had a budget for two floors. His price on one floor was higher than we would have had for both, and that was his compensation for taking on that additional risk. So the learning opportunity that we had, um, we decided we'd like to go ahead and reject. We don't recommend that the board take one bid at a much higher than our um, anticipated amount. And we'd like to go ahead and um, test a small project this summer. Let's go ahead and, and retry some of the soy-based product to see if it would work correctly if applied properly, um, and if we would have the same popping of tile issues as we had previously. So we're gonna take a small um, area and um, remove the carpet, um, follow the same practice that, that we would hope that would be followed, and determine whether or not that would be successful. That will help reshape our specifications when we go back on the street and maybe we can help balance some of the risk versus cost of this project. Um, so our recommendation is reject this bid and we will do a little, um, to take Andy's word, we'll do a little tile project and then we'll come back with a, another specification and recommendation to the board at a later point. Thank you, could I just ask a question? Is, is there a reason to expect that using the same stuff on the same tile will have a different result this year? We hope so. <coughs> Although we didn't actually observe the company use it, the, the general thought on our end is that they ap either applied too much, so they didn't follow the manufacturer's recommended specifications on how to apply um, the product, thereby allowing it to sink into the concrete. Um, some of you may recall we did have the concrete expert come and, and talk about that. I that remember that. <laughs> very riveting. Um, who knew there was a concrete expert? 
<coughs> but also the manufacturer, um, we've talked to the manufacturer and also some of the other projects they've done, and it doesn't seem to be a common result of using their product. So really makes us focus on the fact that it was not applied correctly. So let's apply it correctly and then test the theory. So would we be using a different contractor this time? We would probably, if it's a small area, maybe even just do it ourselves or, you know, it's, it's not really much s space. So, um, or we could even go to a contractor that we're familiar with and Thank give you. it a whirl. Other questions? If you're going to be doing a test, you'd have to abate that area though, correct? If you're pulling up the tiles or you're going to pull up tiles that you know don't have asbestos underneath? No, it actually has to do with the abatement because last year when we did the Deer Pass Tile Project, the reason that we focused in on the mastic remo remover is that we had areas that did not have asbestos underneath the carpeted in the, t in the tiles, and we had areas that, that were. The areas where the mastic remover was not used adhered beautifully the first time, so really says, okay, it really had to do with the abatement process. So it would be an abatement um, test as well. Other questions or comments? Hearing none. Could I have a motion to reject the Deer Path Middle School tile abatement bid? I move to reject the bid. Could I have a second? Second. second. Uh, roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We now move to approval of the Silver Point website addendum for LDAP. Mr. Simic. Thank you, Mr. Anderson and Mrs. Whipple and Mr. DuBose will uh, shed some light on uh, this situation which is um, over my head, I'm afraid. And it's over mine as well. I'm going to let Cornelius talk to um, exactly what this is in effect with the website. He'll be much more succinct this topic. <laughs> the new website um, ha has three portals, a parent portal, a student portal, and a, and a faculty staff portal. And faculty and staff, students, the users of, the, of these portals would authenticate to these portals with a username and a password and then be able to enter that portal and see things appropriate to whatever their role is. So a student would see um, things appropriate to students, uh, their classes, um, so forth and so on. Uh, in order for it, in order for them for, for that to work, we need a, to set up a username and password. Uh, students already have a usernames and passwords as well as faculty. LDAP would allow us to share the usernames and passwords that we currently use within the district with the external website, so that the users of the site could use the same usernames and passwords, and not have to learn new, new usernames and passwords. So it would be an easy transition. If they change their username on the school side, it would change the username uh, on the website, so that would be a, an ease of use. And also, we have some opportunities for single sign-on, where you log into the website using your username and password, and it opens up um, other facilities like Google Apps um, and uh, possibly some other things. Um, and if we could keep the username and password the same, then that just makes it the site, uh, it creates an ease of use for the site. So that's what LDAP will do. Um, it will create that sync between our server and, and the website um, host server that will allow uh, ease, of, ease of use for login. Cornelius, it's way above my head as well, but uh, does implementing LDAP affect the security of the students and or teachers' information? If LDAP is, it could, if LDAP was open if LDAP wasn't encrypted. So uh, this would be an encrypted LDAP communication. So, so, uh, so there would be a secure uh, communication. I'm just curious, are you saying that um, they would have to use multiple IDs or they would have to use a new ID? Because my familiar, I'm a little familiar with LDAP from my corporate world and obviously when you have customers, you want them to have a single point of entry and you want it to be as user-friendly as possible. I would argue in this particular case, we do have a bit of a captive audience. And when I look at $9,000 across the two districts over the course of the five-year contract, it's not you know, a tiny amount of money. So I'm just trying to understand the real cost benefit. I am saying that 
they would be able to use the same username and password they use internally for the external site and not have to use another password. So it is, is it just simply moving to a new user ID and password or is it multiple user ID and password? I'm not certain I understand the question. It's the same, you can it's use the, the it's same the, one. It's the same one, it's the same, so I would use cdubos and my password to get me on everything internally as well as to the external site. What we're really trying to do is make it easier for the user, if that helps. And so it would be a single way to sign on. That would be our concern is that you, if you would have to have multiple ways. You, you could theoretically use the same password and username across both systems. This you is could. really more of a, con a convenience fee. Exactly. You only have to go to one place to do it, right? LDAP, LDAP allows for what you just described, yes. But even without LDAP, what he described, if I want to use M. Borkowski here, I could also use M. Borkowski there. Your I username would is not the issue. The issue is really the password. Uh, it, you would use the same username because I can import your username. But I can't export your password out of our system to import it into their system. None of, no system allows you to get the password out. But so when I set up for the first time on the new site, you, I could use the same password if I wanted. You would not set up. We would, you, would, you, would, you would be set up by us. So yes, we could give you a password. You could log in and you could change your password. Subsequent, subsequent changes in passwords locally on the internal system would not migrate to the external system. You'd have to change it here and you'd have to change it there. So really it's a, it's a matter of ease of use to have one password change, one password uh, that flows for both, both opportunities. But if I change my password, is it just a matter of changing my password? I mean, I, I'm not... I understand it's much easier to use via the LDAP, but if we decided not to do it, then what would be the backup plan? If, if we decide not to do it, I would, exp I would import into the website the usernames, because I know what everyone's username is, it's their first initial last name. And I would import into the website a, a default uh, password for everyone, and then we would have to distribute those passwords. They, people would have to log in to the, pass, to the site, change their password if they decide, decided they want to change their password. There would simply would, it, would, it would just would not be, uh, have as much ease of, of use as if we used LDAP. But it, we could certainly make the site work, yes. Go ahead. It, one of the things that I, I, I know from conversations is that there's a fair amount of consternation uh, from from both of you about you know dog on it you know uh, why didn't we see this coming and why didn't we foresee this and so on can you run through how that how that happened because this is unusual and in when it when it arose it's like you know this is not where you want to be coming back and making an addendum to the contract but that's that's a common question it, you certainly don't um, we, we, we entered into discussions with, with the vendor. Uh, I, I, I think the committee was very excited about the vendor, very excited about the things that they had to offer. Um, and I, I will just have to accept this. It, it was not in the RFP and um, we did not discuss it with them. When we sat down in the room to discuss what is the best way to do, uh, to, to create these logins, the subject of LDAP came up. I said, that's a perfect way to do it and they go up oh, it's not in your contract so uh, then we were back looking for the addendum I will say that we were able to negotiate that they would not charge a setup fee just it would be the ongoing cost so we were able to have that absorbed into the original contract um, even though it wasn't a part of the original contract but it wouldn't have been in the other proposals as well and we did have 10 in that RFP and it was not something that was asked for. So, you know, it would be still the apples to apples comparison. Other questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, uh, could I have a motion to approve the Silver Point website addendum, which I'll, and I'll pronounce this correctly next this time, LDAP, for the LDAP? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Could we have a roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk? Mrs. Fisher? Yes. 
so sorry. Can I ask another question? Can we I'm go sorry. back and do that? I'm sorry. Okay. So I'm thinking of this and knowing that I was a part of this process as well um, and felt that we selected Silver Point not just because certainly we were excited about it, um, about the aesthetics and the services that it offered, but because of the people who we were working with and I think that that was very fruitful, that portion of time that they spent with us. Um, and I feel like the amount of money that we agreed to and that we are spending was very in the middle of all of the ones that we considered and probably got more customer service out of it than we would have even in the ones that we would have spent more money. What I'm wondering about as we're saying this is kind of a convenience fee um, and in my estimation right now I'm thinking well it's worth it because we're having such a transition as we're moving over to this new website that we want to make it as user-friendly possible to all of us, the parents, the students, the staff coming in um, right, right here and now. Is there an option to do this just on an annual basis, this convenience fee to have the LDAP program or do they just say it's all or none? Do you see what I'm saying? I do see what you're saying. Um, I, you're basically asking could, could we do it at the beginning, set it up, right. and you know, get people into the system. Um, we would have to talk to Silver Point about that. Um, but I, I think the, the, the real, one of the, the real strengths of LDAP is that you are able to change your password in one place and have that change migrate to other places. And so if you terminate that sync between our server and their server, you lose that, that, that that ease of use uh, for for the users, uh, be they new users or old users, over the course of the year. Okay. Do we require uh, students or teachers or administrators to change their passwords in our system on a monthly, quarterly, annual basis? No. No, we don't. So once you get both passwords set up, you theoretically don't ever have to change them ever again. You don't have. You don't have to, but but people, but people do. do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Last question, just from a cost perspective, it's for District 67, it'd be $900 a year for five years. Yeah. So we're talking about $4,500 for the life of the contract. Yes. yes. Thank you, Mrs. Thank Fisher. Thank you. Does anyone else have comments? Okay. <laughs> I can't remember now if we had a motion or not. We did. All right. Then we we're ready for a roll call vote. Yeah. I think it's going to be. <laughs> Mrs. Fisher. Yay. Mr. Lemke. Aye. Mr. Anderson. Wait, is yay a, a nay or an aye? Aye. <laughs> aye. Aye. Mr. Anderson. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Folker. Aye. Mr. Borkowski. I'll just go with yay. <laughs> Mr. Schuler. I want to give it a yay. <laughs> aye. Mrs. Clemenson. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We now move to an approval of ISA IASB Board Policy 2.150. Uh, um, the way policies work, typically there's a first reading of a policy approved by the board and then a final um, passage the, the following month. Um, this is a sort of a small update actually that was noted by a board member. It says in our existing board policy that um, board committees can only have two members on them. And as you know, we moved from having um, three major committees, finance, operation, and education to two, and um, moved from having two members on each committee to having three, and never updated the policy. And so we need to do that. We are going with that new structure and we propose um, three members on each um, committee. So in order to be in compliance, we need to pass this um, policy. It would be okay from my standpoint to, uh, um, I think, waive the first reading and pass it right away. However, if board members would prefer, we can certainly have a first reading and then pass it um, next month. So I think the way it is structured 
I'm going to make a motion to waive the first reading and move to a second reading. Um, and then we'll see what happens after that. So, may I have a motion to waive the first reading? Well, let me first ask if there's any questions or comments. Can you read the proposed new policy text? It says something to the effect of um, board committees may have no long more than three members. And that's been changed from may have no more than two members. Thank you. Uh, for people listening or, or watching, um, one of the things we did was we asked that a uh, hard copy of the board policy manual be printed out and given to all board members. So um, we'll hopefully have more board members than in the past who have, who have read the board policy. Um, may I have a motion to waive the first reading and move to the second reading of policy 2.150? So moved. May I have a second? Second. Could I have a roll call vote? Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Yay. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Motion carried. The motion having carried, we can now move to approval of IASB Board Policy 2.150, second reading, which will be the final reading. May I have a motion to approve the IASB Board Policy 2.150 update on second reading? So moved. I have a second. Second. Over here. Uh, may I have a roll call vote, Madam Clerk? Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Volker? Aye. Motion carries. The next item is the approval of resignation of a tenured teacher. May I have a motion to approve the resignation of a tenured teacher pursuant to the terms discussed in closed session? So moved. May I have a second? Second. May I have a roll call vote, Madam Clerk? Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We now move to the approval of human resources report. Mr. Simic. I recommend that the human resources report be approved as presented. Any questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the human resources report? So moved. I have a second. Second. May I have a roll call vote, please, Madam Clerk? Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mr. Schuler. Aye. Motion carries. We now move to approval of the consent agenda. Board members will note there are a number of items on the consent agenda which are listed in your packet. Should I read all of them? I will now read all of them. Uh, they include disbursements of payrolls and financial statements from April 2013, minutes of a special meeting May 7, 2013, minutes of a joint board workshop, May 9, 2013, minutes of an executive session, April 23, 2013, minutes of a regular meeting, April 23, 2013, minutes of a budget hearing, April 23, 2013, minutes of a special meeting, May 23, 2013, disposal of audio recordings, October 2011. Are there any items which any board member would like to remove for further discussion? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented? So moved. May I have a second? Second. May I have a roll call vote, Madam Clerk? Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mr. Schuler? 
Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We have, excuse me, two uh, FOIA requests this month. One from a Mr. Howard Handler of Barrington, excuse me, Barrington Associate of Realtors in, in Northbrook, and one from a Ms. Gloria Backman of Elmhurst. Announcements. Monday, June 3rd is eighth grade graduation from Deer Pass. Wednesday, June 5th is the last day of school for kindergarten. Thursday, June 6th is the last day of school for grades one through seven. And this is actually, I believe, changed from the agenda. Next, June 18th is the next meeting of the Board of Education uh, at 7 p.m. right here in this very uh, room. Can we just verify, Mr. Anderson? Thursday, June 6th is the last day, or is it Friday, June 7th due to the snow day? I'm happy to hear that, June 6th, because yes. I think we discussed earlier it was June 7th, but it is June 6th. Originally it was June 5th, and then Great. it got moved. We, we should ask the superintendent who's authoritative on this matter. I defer to uh, Mrs. Fowler. No, you guys did. Okay. The director of curriculum says that it is no, the, the 6th. We're going to go with that. It's June 6th. Okay. Great. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. The next item is um, adjournment. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So, so moved. moved. May I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, meeting is adjourned.